Hello folks, and thank you for joining me for another reading on the Freemasonic Knowledge Channel. And, uh, we're gonna go with the Ashlars, author unknown, for this, uh, reading. We are told that the Ashlars lie open in the lodge for the brethren to moralize on. Moralize on. Sorry. Did you ever see a brother contemplating the Ashlars and trying to derive some moral benefit from them? For the most part, they are quickly referred to and just as quickly forgotten. The Ashlar is the free stone as it comes from the quarry. The rough ashlar is the stone in its rude and natural state and is emblematic of man in his natural state, ignorant, uncultivated, and vicious. But when education has exerted its wholesome influence in expanding his intellect, restraining his passions, and purifying his life, he then is represented by the perfect ashlar which, under the skillful hands of workmen, have been smooth has been smoothed and squared and fitted for its place in the building however you will observe that the rough ashlar in the masonic lodge is not in its rude or natural state it has been squared in a fashion partially smoothed and has apparent strength and solidarity it possesses all the qualities that could make it a perfect stone for use in the construction of the temple but it needs the hands and skill of the perfect craftsman to bring out about that result. It represents a candidate for membership in a Masonic Lodge. Such an applicant is not in his rude or natural state, neither ignorant, uncultivated, or vicious. Masonry does not accept men of such qualifications. The applicant, by education and perseverance, has fitted himself as a respectable man in his community, assuming full responsibility as a citizen, a churchman, and a member of his family. There is a vast number of men in every community possessing such qualifications who are not members of the Masonic Lodge and may never have the desire to associate themselves with the ancient craft. A man judges Masonry by the actions and manner of living of those he knows are members of the order, but knows little or nothing of its teachings or objectives in the building of the character. In that sense, he is in the crude state of a rough ashlar, possessing all the qualities or perfect material, but lacking the polish that comes from a continued study and practice of the great teachings of masonry. Memberships in a lodge, or membership in a lodge does not ta make a man a mason. He must apply his abilities to improving all in him that falls short of that high standard set by masonry in character and citizen building. If he is satisfied with being a master mason in name only, he loses the benefits of further advancement and improvement offered by membership in the order. In other words, he falls short of anything that might be termed the perfect ashlar. The perfect ashlar is for the more expert craftsmen to try and adjust his jewels on. In ancient times, the crude tools that would not even be used in this age, workmen of great skill and experience produced material for construction for the construction of the temple, having such perfection that each piece fitted perfectly into its place without adjustment or correction. Time was not one of the essential factors, perfection was the goal. To keep this state of perfection in absolute balance, a standard must have been set whereby the workmen could constantly test their tools to know that continued wear and use had not changed the measurements, even in the slightest degree. Did they have a perfect ashlar on which to make such a test? We are told that the perfect ashlar is for, is for the more expert workmen to try and adjust their tools on. In masonry, we are the workmen, whether we be active or inactive, workers or drones, what are our jewels, our most prized possession? If we have absorbed any of the teachings masonry, the building of character and Christian way of life are the two of the many jewels that should constantly be before us. And in the building of that state of perfection to which we attain, what perfect ashlar have we that we might go to and try the tools which, 
with which we have been working to know that they are still of fine quality and in perfect condition for the job that lies before us. In every Masonic Lodge there rests an altar on the altar in the center of the room, the V-O-T-S-L. It is the solid foundation upon which masonry in our lives is built. It never changes. Civilizations may come and go, but the books of books, the book of books remains the same, adaptable to all conditions and manner of men, in good times and bad, in peace or war, a guide for mankind. How often do we consult this guide to try to adjust the jewels which are ours and which may need to be altered to get them back to that state of perfection which we as Masons should endeavor at all times to hold as our standard way of life? I am afraid that in this busy world of today we neglect this practice. Therefore, as we think of the Ashlars and try to do a little moralizing, let us forget, even for a brief period, the material things in our lives and direct our thoughts to the more important duty of contemplating our own defects and shortcomings and adjusting our way of life and bringing it more in harmony with that standard given us by the great Creator in the V.O.T.S.L. The Ashlars are not just two pieces of stone. They represent what we have been and what we hope to be. It is up to each individual mason to pass his own judgment on himself and to adjust his jewels accordingly, so that when the time comes and he lays down his tools and makes the final journey to the Grand Lodge above, he may leave behind a reputation as a wise counselor, a pillar of strength and stability, a perfect ashlar on which younger masons may test the correctness and value of their own contribution to the Masonic order. The Plum Rule Author Unknown The jewels of the three principal officers of a lodge are also the working tools of the fellow craft degree. They are the plum, the level, and the square. Why are these jewels given these distinctions? There are two basic reasons. First, in earlier times, the fellow craft was the ultimate degree. There was no master mason degree. The fellow craft was the journeyman of today. The working tools of a fellow craft were the tools of a master craftsman or journeyman. When the master mason degree was instituted, other working tools were selected to fill, fulfill the ritual requirements. Secondly, while masonry makes use of many esteemed working tools, i.e. gavel, 24-inch gauge, trowel, skirt, chisel, pencil, setting maul, etc., it is the square, level, and the plumb which are the fundamental tools that are absolutely necessary to erect any edifice, be it physical or spiritual. The plumb or the plumb rule is an instrument of antiquity. The earliest craftsmen used a weighted cord as a plumb. The Greeks of yore formed a bob of lead on a cord and they gave it a name, Malubdos, or Malubdos, meaning lead. Uh, from this working tool evolved the name Molybdenum, Molybdenum, the name of a well known metal, Molybdenum, Molybdenum, I can't pronounce it very well, but anyway. Uh, the ever practical Romans took the word and Latinized it to become plumbum. Uh, plumbum. Uh, the <laughs> plumbum. Ha <laughs> ha. Plumbum. The tool to measure perpendiculars of structures, walls, aqueducts, and fortifications in every corner of the Roman Empire. The Gauls adopted the tool, and their successors, the Normans, shortened the word to plumb. The Britons added the letter A to coin a new word, aplomb meaning not easily upset, not off-center. Later, the Englishman revised the spelling to plum, and it became a verb as well as a noun. Early English marin mariners used this tool. Shakespeare called it a plummet. Deeper than air a plummet sounded. It was the French who began to call the lead bob a ball. In French, bow means a ball of lead. Small lead balls or bows, bows uh, were the primitive bullets. Uh, the Latins modified the word to bulla, 
they used very small bullets which they compressed into a thin wafer utilizing it as a legal seal for documents thus was born the popple bull it is definitely not of bovine origins and that's a lie it is of bovine origins the popple bull comes from the catholic church and it is of bovine origins uh has nothing to do with bullets or balls of lead or any of that 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 this author uh, goes to but anyway okay while originally a simple lead weight on a string if you want to know the bull goes clear back to nimrod okay let's be quite correct babylon the bull uh and nimrod if you're not familiar you can just look up those terms uh and find plenty of information on it while originally a simple lead weight on a string the plum when required by an expert craftsman evolved into the shape of the junior warden's jewel and specifically adapted for operative stonemasons it is interesting to note that this jewel or tool is sometimes found to be richly embellished with symbols sun moon all seeing eye etc and at other times very plain reference to the plum arises throughout masonic rituals and books and throughout the lore of masonic catch questions examples question how long have you been a mason ever since i was ra answer is ever since i was raised from a dead level to a living perpendicular on the squares by the hand of a friend whom later i found to be a brother if you were to visit an american york Wright lodges you will find that in the fc degree the vsl is opened on the book of amos and it contains an excellent example of the beauty of the plum behold the lord stood upon the wall with a plumb line in his hand he said amos what seest thou amos replied a plumb line and the lord said behold i will set a plumb line amidst my people israel and i will pass by them never more to the operative masons the level and plumb were intertwined and together they formed a square brethren the plumb rule is an instrument used in architecture by which a building is raised in a perpendicular direction it is and it is figurative of an upright and true course of life it typifies care against any deviation from the masonic upright line of conduct if you apply the square to the level you get the plumb the living perpendicular esteemed by all true craftsmen and the emblem of growth and immortality it is a truly magnificent magnificent jewel and indispensable working tool and when applied to the work with its fellows the square and the level it opens the doorway of that middle chamber in those immortal mansions whence all goodness emanates <laughs> The best uh, logician is our God, whom the conclusion never fails. He speaks, it is, he wills, it stands, he blows, it falls, he breathes, it lives. His words are true, even without proof. His counsel rules without command. Therefore can none foresee his end, unless on God is built his hope. And if we here below would learn, by compass needle squared plumb, we never must overlook the meat where with our God hath measured us. Uh, the poem is written by J.V.A. Andre, a German, and printed in 1623, translated into English by F.F. F. Schnitzer and G.W. Speth. Brethren, I give to you one last reference from Isaiah. 25 16 to 17 therefore thus saith the lord god behold i lay in zion for a foundation a stone a tried stone a precious cornerstone a sure foundation he that believeth shall not make haste judgment also will i lay to the line and righteous to the plummet references the book of volume of sacred law King James Version, uh, the work, 1966, or, or 1976 edition, and uh, Freemason at Work, Harry Carr, and uh, History and Evolution of Freemasonry, Dara the Builders, Newton, A Freemason's Guide, and 
Compendium Jones papers given at the Alberta Masonic Spring Workshop in the 1960s. So these were passed out at workshops to people and with the author unknown. So you get the plum rule and you get the Ashlars. And uh, I thank you for joining me.